Do we now want to understand how backpropagation in this case in our RNN cell works because we use the RNN cell recursively for every time step and it will be a bit different from what you probably know concerning backpropagation in other cases. And I want to explain the mathematical background first and then we want to translate the equations into code in the second part of this chapter. So let us just take a look at the RNN cell again and we have these different learnables, so the weights WX, WH, we have the bias, and we also have WY uh, for our output. And remember, we use this cell recursively, so we have an input XT, and it generates an output YT, but it also passes information uh, to the next time step, which we're going to do with the state vector H. And then we combine this information with the information from the next x of t and again creating yt. So when you want to do uh, back propagation, we somehow have to take this into account and have to follow uh, the timeline recursively. But uh, before we do this, let us just first take a look at the map itself. So what we are going to do at the end is that we have our output y. And I want to show these equations again. And this output y creates the prediction. And we we we'll call this prediction y hat and compare it to the actual values, to the training data. And um, whatever the training data is, and I will show you then also later that we um, have different ways how to train our RNN. But the thing is that we have this difference here, uh, which is then our loss function and the change of the loss function. So we want to minimize the loss function implies a change of y. So we have our loss function and we want to minimize the loss function. And of course, the loss function is a function of all these learnables. So the change of y is also um, a function of all these learnables. And I also want to remind you on the um, on the way how to do that. So the optimization works with um, gradient descent, which is a very uh, basic method. And in principle, all these optimization tools work more or less with one of those versions of gradient descent. I explained gradient descent in more detail in the other lectures. Um, so please feel free to look at the uh, lecture CNN from scratch or ANN from scratch. Um, but I still want to give you a short overview about or a short reminder on how gradient descent works. So we have our um, loss function. And based on the loss function, we want to find a new value for the weights to improve the loss function, so to decrease the loss function in our case. So we have an old value of our weights, and I just picked Wx just as an example. So remember, the loss function, of course, depends on all the other learnables. But let's say we only pick one uh, learnable and freeze all the others, and just see um, how it changes um, according to this particular learnable, which is Wx now. You see the loss function itself uh, is four-dimensional, it's actually five-dimensional because you have a value for all these four, for a combination of all these four values. Um, but it can be arbitrarily complicated, so it's hard to create a plot. And that's why we just focus on one variable um, just to show the example. So you have a new value, and you want to create, so you want to calculate this new value based on the loss function and based on the old value. So how do you change the old value? And if you see this equation, we can derive it, but I also want to illustrate this graphically um, that it uh, becomes clear how that works. So let's say we have our loss function and ideally you want to have a global minimum of the loss function. So that would be the best fit. And this loss function is a function of the learnable Wx. And again, it's also a function of all the other learnables, of course, but let's focus on Wx. So there will be a minimum. What we have here is the derivative of this loss function, so the change with respect to Wx. And if this change, for example, is negative, then we are on the left side of this graph here. So we have an old value of our learnable, and we have a new value, and our loss function uh, or gradient is negative, then we will move in this direction, so from left to right. Would it actually work with this equation? So if our gradient is negative, then 
we multiply this with minus one or minus epsilon, so that's positive. So that would move our old value of the weight to the right. So the new value is closer to the minimum. So it actually works. And if we were on the other side of the graph, then the slope would be positive, the gradient would be positive. So we would move further to the left. So depending on the gradient, we move to the right um, in the right direction and hopefully eventually will find um, a local a global minimum and not a local minimum. So, but that's the idea of gradient descent. So we just follow the gradient of the loss function and descend according to the gradient and how large the step size is going to be as determined by the learning rate epsilon. And again, um, there are more details about that and the other lectures, but I hope um, the idea is clear again. And then we have an algorithm and mathematical recipe that tells us how to uh, calculate those changes of the learnables according to the loss function. So what we have to calculate is the change of all these weights. So therefore, we just have to calculate the derivative on the right-hand side for all the different learnables. And that's what we are going to do. So we just have to look at the equations that makes up our RNN cell. And then we just follow uh, the chain rule and calculate all the derivatives. So let's start with Wx. So we want to calculate the derivative of the loss function with respect to Wx. And the loss function, of course, depends on delta y. So this is the loss function to so the derivative of delta, so of, of the loss function with respect to y. And this is what we get as an input. So we get the, the delta y from the input from the loss function directly. But then we have to calculate dy dht then dht, then the outer derivative of the tangents times the inner derivative of the tangents times the derivative with respect to wx, because that's what we want to calculate, the change with respect to wx. And what is the result? So again, we get from the loss function delta y directly. So that's the, the um, inputs in the other lectures, and that will be the, the values um, which will be the input of the back propagation part. So we will maintain the same structure um, that we have in all uh, that we have been using in all these other lectures. Um, and if you haven't watched one of those lectures, um, of course that's not a problem. Uh, I will explain the step by step. But the key part is um, we have to change of the loss function with respect to y already here because here we have delta y and we want to minimize delta y. So then we have the change of y with respect to h, which gives us this here, and it's just w y. Then we have to calculate the outer derivative of h t with respect to w x, which gives me the outer derivative of the tangents hyperbolicus times the inner derivative. And the inner derivative is just x t. So the tangents hyperbolicus, if you just look it up, the derivative is just one minus tangents hyperbolicus squared. So, and that's it. So we have the learning rate, we have the y from the loss function, and we multiply this with the current weight with the derivative from the tangents hyperbolicus, it's the outer derivative times the inner derivative, which just gives me an xt. Um, so let's do the same for w y and you see it's the same structure so we still go through all these derivatives that we have here already so dy um, wy and one minus tangents hyperbolic squared the only difference is um, um, is that we now have to calculate the derivative with respect to y and it's ht and for wh we have all the derivatives again, and uh, what is left is the inner derivative, which is W. Uh, so it's the derivative with respect to WH that gives us an HT minus one. So you see, we have all these derivatives here already. And for WY, it's pretty simple because it's just uh, dy, uh, DWY, which is just an HT. So, and there's one thing we have to be aware of. So we have the current ht in the one derivative and we have ht minus one here as well. Uh, so that's a, a time step 
uh, behind the current one and we have to take this into account in our code. So we have ht in ht minus one. Okay, so we have the derivative of all learnables. Um, now the bias, of course, is missing. Um, bias has, it's the same structure again um, as before. So we have all these derivatives here, um, all the, the, the outer derivative from the tangents hyperbolicus. Then we calculate the derivative with respect to the bias. That gives us just one. Um, so that's it. So these are the derivatives of the learnables. And the in the forward part, we just always calculate these values um, for y hat and for h as well. So these are the values for every time point. And now we have to do the reverse process. So we have to start at the last time point because we, in the forward part, essentially loop over xt. Right? We use the same cell recursively. But now we have to do this reversively over time. So we have to start at the last point in time where we have our dy dt. And then we have to calculate or have to multiply this with wy or also with ht, depends on depending on the um, derivative of the learnable. But we also have to multiply this with the tangents hyperbolicus. And you see the derivative contains the input that we had in the forward part because that's tangents hyperbolicus squared of the input. And for every time step, of course, we had a different input value. So therefore, in the back propagation part, we have also a different value for the derivative. So for every time step, uh, we have to remember uh, the input value because we have needed for the multiplication order to calculate the derivative. So we have to remember all these values for the tangents hyperbolicus for every time step. And since we use the same cell recursively, for every time step, all the changes will contribute to the changes of the learnable. So we have to add those changes up. So we have to do all the things backwards. We need a reverse loop starting with the last time point or the last point in time, calculating all these changes and then continue with the next um, time point. And why it goes backward or because it's, it's going backwards in time, it's called back propagation through time. So in order to do so, um, we need to restructure our code a bit. So I want to show the code first, and um, then we want to do it all together. Um, so we have the RNN cell in our forward part. And um, we have to uh, re restructure the cell and want to create an own RNN cell. But first, we have to take a look at the activation function, because we are um, we're using um, the tangents hyperbolicus for the different time steps. So therefore we have to remember uh, the different derivatives and and way how to do this is to uh, call different instances during the loop. And therefore we can keep track of the derivatives and I'm gonna show you how that works. And the second part is that we, what I mentioned is that we now have to go to the forward part and it makes more sense that we take the, the code that we have in the forward part and create our own RNN cell and then just call the RNN cell. And the RNN cell um, calculates the values for every time step, but we want to call this RNN cell for every epoch. So it makes more sense in the code later for the structure um, that we define our RNN cell and then also call the RNN cell, especially also when we want to apply uh, our RNN, it makes more sense to have this cell separately. Um, so that's what we have to do now. So let's start, however, with the tangents hyperbolicus. So let us first of all create a class, tangents hyperbolicus, and then we just call different instances of the class. So how does it work? So of course, um, we have for inputs and the forward part, then we just have the function tangents hyperbolicus and numpy, so it takes care of that. Uh, that will be our input. We put it into tangents hyperbolicus and it creates the output. 
And we also want to save the input um, just in case we want to just track some error messages. The important part is that we have our inputs here. And for the backward part, we have the D values, which is the outer derivative. And now we have to multiply the outer derivative with the derivative from the tangents hyperbolicus. And if you look at the, uh, if you do the math, or if you look it up in Wikipedia, you will see it's one minus the actual value squared. And that's why we need the output. I need to remember that. So for every time step, of course, the output has a different value. So therefore the derivative here has a different value. And then we multiply um, the derivative of the tangents hyperbolicus with what comes from externally the dh. So we have to take this, which is one minus tangents hyperbolicus squared and multiply this. And of course we have to multiply this uh, element wise. So we use NP multiply. And therefore we uh, multiply the inner derivative. So which is here the inner derivative with the outer derivative, which comes from the layer um, just beneath the current one. And we always call them the values. In our case, it's the H. So it's um, the H, the whatever the derivative is, let's say WX. Then we first have to multiply the H with the derivative from the tangents. And then we have an output, which is uh, the, the inputs here. And we multiply this with the next derivative. So we have to set up the tangents hyperbolicus, and this is something we can do already. So let's go to our um, to our code, and I would recommend again just to create a new chapter. Um, so we or a new folder. So we just call it number two, and let's call it back propagation through time, and we also want to move to this particular folder and also want to save our current code in this folder. So we just go back propagation in time, save our RNN and also the code uh, that we use for testing our current RNN. So let's now create our class. Um, so the first step, so we have to do two things. We have to restructure this and we have to also set up the class for the activation function. So it's just tangents hyperbolicus, of course. Um, there's no input so far, so we leave that empty. Um, and then we define the forward part. So let me just make no space here and also want to just separate this. That it's clear. Okay, that's a that's the next class here. All right. So we just uh, define the forward part. Where we get the inputs, and that creates the output. So we just use NumPy, tangents hyperbolicus, um, and from the input, and we have NumPy already as a library. And then we also wanna save the inputs um, in inputs, just to make sure uh, that we have those values uh, in case we need to uh, track down error messages. So that's the forward part and the backward part is just dealing with the derivatives. So you saw in the slides, we have just the, we just apply the chain rule. So we just multiply all the outer derivatives until we have the last inner derivative. So we will get a derivative from outside, which we want to call the values. In the same way we did it in the previous lectures and how it's been done in many textbooks. And then we have to calculate the derivative. And the derivative is just calculated by a one minus, and then we have the output, 
squared. So that's just uh, what you find out if you do the math. And then we have the the inputs, or we want to generate the inputs. which will be the, the values for the next layer. So and the, the inputs is just the multiplication of the what is here the inner derivative with the external derivative, so what comes from outside the outer derivative. So that should be Recognize now we have our forward and backward method. All right, and let me now also just show what we are going to do with the tangents hyperbolicus. So we may now um, just import it. So if we just say import my RNN, then we also have imported the tangents. So let me just make some space here. Um, so we have the tangents hyperbolicus, and we can just call it many times. We have, can have different instances. So let's call it just tan H1. It's one instance. And then we have tan h2 um, is the next instance. So let me just copy and paste that. So we have these different instances. And they all have these different properties. So we can just um, look at the forward and the backward method. So what happens now for every time step, uh, we need to calculate this value. And for the back propagation and time, we need this value for calculating the derivative. So what I'm going to do now is to call as many instances as time steps we have. So let's say uh, we have t equals 100 time steps. Um, then we can create a list. Let's call this activation. And then we ca can call a list. Um, so we just call tangents hyperbolicus um, as often as we need. So for t um, in range t. And then we have a list of all these instances. So for example, we can just then go to activation. Uh, for example, get just instance number four, which is the fifth time step. Uh, and then we have access to the forward and the backward part. So and what is important for us will be the backward part. So this is a bug um, in spider. But the point is then for every time step, we will have the uh, backward part and the forward part so we can calculate the derivative. So that's what we're going to do then later. All right, so what's the next step? So um, we have the tangents hyperbolicus where the output is already this derivative here. So the multiplication of these two derivatives. So this part is actually done. And now we need to go to the forward part of our RNN. And now we're going to do what I also mentioned already. It makes more sense to um, take what we have in the forward part and define it as our RNN cell so that we can call it recursively. So we go to the forward part. And we also want to be free with um, how we choose the activation function. So we uh, just add the activation here. Because later, we want to probably just work with other activation functions. And of course, we want to save this activation function. And then we go to the forward part. And we initialize all these learnables. And of course, the size and the shape of these learn uh, of the of the change of the learnables is the same as the learnable. So we can just copy and paste that. We just add an D here. 
um, then we extract all those um, values that we need for the forward part, especially we need the initial state vector, HT. And then the idea is that we call the instances or create the different instances of the activation function. And then we put this part that we have already in um, our forward part in our RNN cell. And that we have a cell that performs the, the calculation of the forward part. And then we just call the cell later. So that's the idea. So it does exactly what we have now in the forward part. But we want to create a cell and then later call the cell in the forward part. So that makes the code a bit more compact, makes it also more flexible. For example, if you want to uh, change something in the cell, uh, the structure of the RNN, um, it doesn't affect the forward part. And also later, if we want to apply the RNN to a data set, uh, we essentially run the forward part, it just calls the cell. So these are the changes that we're going to do. And then we will have our code and let's test our code after we apply those changes. So let's go back uh, to our code. And let's first of all, um, apply all these different changes. So we now have set up our activation function. So we just go to our init. And we also want to be um, free with the activation. So what kind of activation do we want to use? Um, and of course, most of the time we want to have the tangents hyperbolicus, but let's um, include this here as a variable. So we have our activation and we also want to save the activation. So we will also uh, include self activation equals activation. Okay. So now let's go to the forward part and let me just do it in this way so that we um, uncomment this part. But now create a different structure in the forward part. So we have forward or forward part by itself. And now we want to initialize the D weights. Because for every epoch, we have to recalculate the weights. And then we have to add them to the actual weights. And that's why we uh, cannot initialize the weight in the forward part, because then they would be overwritten all the time. So we initialize those weights, or the D weights. So we just write down D. And we want to do this with NPC rows. And as an input, there's a, a you need a shape. And we have to do this for all the D weights. So make sure that there's always a D because otherwise you would overwrite the current weights. Um, and there's one more thing. So it's complaining about uh, the name neurons. So we remember, or we have the, the number of the neurons, of course, um, already saved. All right. So let me just add a space here. 
So now we have all the, the weights that we want to calculate for every epoch. And in the forward part, we want to call our RNN cell, which performs this here. So we want to call this RNN cell. And what do we need um, for running the, the forward parts? So we say, of course, we have to call the cell at some point. And what do we need for that? We need XT and HT as an input. So first of all, we have to call XT. So let me just call this here explicitly. Then we want to call H as well. Also y hat. And now we want to start with the initial value of h, which is ht. Um, and of course, that's the initial value. So now we have our activation function. And now we want to create the instances of the activation function. So we just call it, say, act. And then I'm going to do what I just showed you here. Um, we just create a list um, of our of the instances of our activation function. So our activation, whatever this activation is, comes from here, of course. So that's our activation. So that's a variable now, and it might stand for a tangent hyperbolicus. And we have to do this t times. So in the forward part here, uh, when we call the cell, uh, the activation function has to be an input, because then we just call the activation function here. And we will also call this then in the backward part in the same way. All right, so let's do that. Um, so we want to now run our RNN cell. And it has to perform the calculation for every time step. So what do we need as an input? So we want to have xt as an input, so the entire vector xt here, and because we want to run the rnn cell. So we just want to say self rnn cell. So we want to have xt as an input. Then we start with the initial value ht. We also need the activation function or the list of the instances of the activation function to be more correct. And we also need h because we want to calculate h as a function of t and want to save that. We want to keep track of the states. Um, and of course, we want to use y hat um, to calculate because we calculate y hat, so the prediction for every time step, and of course we want to save it. So in principle, uh, what we did here, um, we want to now do it in our cell. 
So therefore it's pretty clear what the input of the cell is supposed to be. And now we just run this part here over the time to this calculation that we have tested already in our cell. So what will happen? So it will extract an XT. And we just want to make sure that XT has the correct shape uh, because we want to apply uh, NP dot. And therefore, we have to reshape it just to make sure that it has the correct shape and that NP dot to so the operation works properly. Then it creates the output here, which is still the same thing. So it calculates the output. Oh well. So it calculates the output by multiplying those values. And this is an HT then. And that's the HT for the first time step. So we have the HT here. It gets into the cell here. And then we have HT here. Now there's this part. So this part is no different. So we just go to our activation function. And the same way as we did here, so I can just call then one particular instance, let's say number six. And then we have our instance, and this instance has all the different um, methods. So that's what I'm doing now here as well. So we have the forward part. Which performs the calculation of the tangents hyperbolicus, but also stores the information that we need for the back propagation. So even though we're actually working on the forward part and still not on the backward part yet, we have to take care what we want to do in the backward part later. And then it calculates the tangents hyperbolicus, which is just the output um, of our activation function. So we do not need this part anymore. But we still, of course, calculate h hat. have it all nicely lined. So we still calculate h hat. And then we have the prediction. Uh, sorry, y hat. Then we have the prediction y hat. So we still calculate y hat. And we have a new value of ht. And so we start with the initial value. And then it's calculating the new value of ht every time. So it will propagate through time. So therefore we want to save those values. Remember T is always one time step ahead for H, or H is always one time step ahead. And we want to save this HT. And then we also want to save Y hat or the result of Y hat for the time point T, which is the current value Y hat T. So, which makes it pretty clear what we want to return. So, um, let me just put it in parentheses. Um, don't have to do that. I just, it's a, I just find it, uh, it just find it looks nicer. So we have our um, activation function because we might also want to keep track of those values um, because of the how the gradient changes over time. Same reason we want to keep track of the states. And of course, we want to have the prediction as an output. Um, so because we want to know, of course, what the result is. Which pretty much also defines the cell here. The output of the cell 
then we call it here. Then we have all um, we have all the different outputs. So we have a cell now just performing the forward calculation. We call it in the forward method. So it's performing all these calculations. And if we want to change something in the cell, we only need to change it here. So we call our cell. And then of course, we also want to save the result that we get from this cell. So we want to save Y hat. Maybe let's do it like this, so. Then H, because for every epoch, of course we want to have going to have a different value than and also we want to save the activation function. Okay, so if there's no typo um, and we're going to test this in a, in a minute, um, that's the code so far and let me therefore just summarize our codes that we have so far. So We have our tangents hyperbolicus that we have implemented. Then we have our init part where we now call or where we have the activation function as an input. We set up the matrices for the learnables and also for our state. Then in the forward part, we set up the matrices for the uh, change of the, so for the D weights, the change of the learnables. Then we create a list of instances for the activation function. Then we run our RNN cell. And our RNN cell creates the output for one epoch, but for every time point. So it's time to test the code now. So we import our RNN. Then we run the forward part. Then we should have a Y hat, an H, and a T. And then we can always, of course, calculate the difference between the prediction and the actual value and calculate the loss function. And then we will um, optimize this process and we'll uh, run this over different epochs using gradient descent then this value L, of course, should decrease. And we also want to plot uh, the prediction versus the actual values. So we should see something like that. Well, let's see what we should get for states. So if you, for example, plot the different states, um, what should we get? So we pass random values, more or less, um, through the tangents hyperbolicus, which maps values going from infinity to minus infinity to plus infinity to minus one and plus one. So if we just plot the states, let's say um, for every neuron, the first 20 time steps or so, uh, then we should actually see something like that. So mainly they should be between, or they should be close to minus one and plus one. And of course there are some values in between, but you should see this uh, zigzag of course. Um, so that you have these different values here, mainly minus one and plus one, but you can still have some values in between, but you see there are lots of values uh, that are close to minus one and plus one. So that's of course still not a proof that everything works perfectly, but we should see some structures like this, um, then we are at least uh, not so far off. So we start with random values, um, they should look like this a bit, um, and then we also, based on the random values, calculate the states, and it should look like this. So let's go to our code and let's test this. So um, let me just rerun this here. So we um, start with a certain number of neurons. We have our test data. I want to plot this again. So it's just a sinus. 
um, with some noise, then we of course call now our network. And we call now the network of the activation function, which is the tangent hyperbolicus in our case. And now we run the forward part. And let's see whether we get an error message. <clears throat> so there's no error message so far. And now we wanna, so we don't need this part. And now we wanna call I had H and also T. So we don't need this part anymore because that's being done now in our code. And now we want to calculate dy and the loss function itself. And of course, that's just an arbitrary value because um, our network is still not able to learn. Um, we wanna also want to plot our initial values. And you see, you should see this noisy zigzag pattern. And for H as well, we should see something like that. So if you see, if your plots look like that, um, then there's a big chance that the code is going to do the right thing. All right, and um, what we also should see is, and you can try that, so the RNN now has the activation function as a class, and this activation function uh, now ha should have the different uh, methods, backward and forward, and also should have the input and the output. So we can also quickly just test this. So if we just um, expand this a bit, um, so if you just go to RNN, um, first of all, it has all these different uh, classes. Then we have our activation function. Let's just pick one of them. Um, so it's tangents hyperbolicus, and it should have all the different methods and also should have the inputs now. So again, this is a bucket spider. Um, and here the values um, for all different neurons. All right, so then we have modified our code. And since we, in the tangents hyperbolicus, multiply this derivative of the dh, <clears throat> we do this for every time point t already. So now we can use this information in the backward part. So how do we set up now the backward part? And that will be the actual backpropagation through time, and that's what we're going to do next.